There's a class of beings mentioned in the Bible who are said to be poised to make their appearance on earth in the latter days. They are supernatural creatures. Tom Horn, welcome to Prophecy Watch. Hey, Gary, great to be with you again. And to your left, Chris. Hi, how are you? Chris Putnam. Tom and Chris have put together this book that addresses uh, the question that I stated at the beginning of the program today, namely, uh, there, there's a group of people waiting in the wings, according to the Bible, who will make their appearance on earth, but we are kind of loath to talk about them. Uh, let's let's begin uh, by by talking about the work that you've done in the past that led up to this particular book called "On the Path of the Immortals." What, yeah. How did you get here? Yeah, well, of course, we've done programming in the past with you on the Petrus Romanus, the final pope is here. Which, when we wrote that, we didn't think that was going to lead to another book, right? Yeah. And what happened was when we were on talk shows and people could call in, people were calling in, well, you're talking about the Pope, you're talking about the Vatican, but what do you make of everything the Vatican is saying right now about astrobiology, about aliens? Because remember, about 36 months ago, this was a big deal, right? right. Rome was sending out its astronomers, Jose Gabriel Funes, Corrado Balducci, uh, uh, Guy Consul Magno, the Pope's personal yeah, astronomer. Yeah. And what were they saying? Would you baptize an alien? And uh, if there are aliens out there, they would be our space brothers and we would accept them uh, into the faith. And so people were calling and they were saying, what, where is the Vatican all of a sudden coming from with all this conversation about aliens? And so what happened was Chris and I determined that if we were going to have an authoritative answer to that question, we couldn't just be a couple of evangelicals that come across on television as if we're taking cheap shots at the Pope's astronomers or taking yeah. them out of context. So a lot of people don't know that in southeastern Arizona is the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope. It's built on the top of Mount Graham, and there's a radio telescope, and then there's the world's largest binocular telescope on the top of Mount Graham. And we thought, you know, if there's if we want to get to the bottom of this, we're going to go to Mount Graham and we're going to talk to the uh, Jesuit astronomers that are working up there on the top of that mountain. But we found out you don't just get in your car and drive up there and say, we're here to see the aliens. I mean, <laughs> no. You know, now, yeah. Interesting. Now, let me, let me just stop right here and say, folks, this is where it gets really interesting because Mount Graham happens to be in, in the middle, is situated in the middle of a large territory of Indian country, mm -hmm. Navajo, Navajo Hopi Reservation area, a and they consider Mount Graham to be a, if you will, a holy mountain or a place of the supernatural, right? That's right, and, and actually that's key to what led to us writing On the Path of the Immortals, because we go to the top of Mount Graham, we visit with the uh, Jesuit astronomer who's up there, we're asking them all these pertinent questions about why are you guys talking about baptizing aliens, where is this all coming from? And that's all in the book Ex of Vaticana, people can get that through Prophecy Watchers if they, don't, if they haven't already read that story. And so, uh, and, and by the way, we also went to the large binocular telescope up there mm -hmm. which has the Lucifer device in it that they're using to monitor something that is in deep space that we think is behind why, uh, you know, Father Malachi Martin in 1997, sure. right? He's asked by Art Bell on Coast to Coast AM, why is the Vatican on top of a mountain? Actually, he said, why did they force themselves onto the, uh, the top of a mountain in Arizona? And what are they doing up there? And Malachi Martin said, well, it's because at the deepest levels of geopolitics inside the Vatican, he said it's because they know what is approaching the earth and that it will be of the utmost importance in coming years. And of course we could go into that whole storyline behind that. But so we go up there, we want to know what was Malachi talking about. We come down off the mountain, we've got this giant 600 page book or whatever it is, and we think we got the answers to everything, right? Sure. Send the book to the typesetter, it's off on its way to the printer, and then we get contacted by a member of the Apache Nation 
and they want us to know why they filed a federal lawsuit against NASA and the Vatican to try to keep them from going onto that mountain, and we had missed the biggest point. The biggest point was Mount Graham is one of the four holiest mountains in the world to all American indigenous people, and it is because it is, in their opinion, a portal, a doorway, a stargate, a strategic wow. location <clears throat> on Earth yeah. where entities have come in and out of this three-dimensional reality since the dawn of time. Well, by the way, you got to know, the conspiracy meter really went off in my head then, uh, and I started reevaluating, oh, wait a minute, maybe there's some other reason that NASA and the Vatican were willing to fight in federal court to get on the top of that mountain. Why not just move to another mountain with the same elevation, right? Now, if you're not interested, you should be. At this point in time, you should be saying, wow, what's next? On the Path of the Immortals uh, by Tom Horn and Chris Putnam. But Chris, we don't mean to leave you out over there. I know you're dying to, to talk about this thing. Chapter 2 of On the Path of the Immortals deals with a really interesting question. Who are the immortals? Now, uh, we're talking to, to Christians here, and, and I, I'm addressing you as a Christian, a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, someone who reads your Bible, uh, you're trying to understand prophecy, you're, you're looking at the things that are happening in the world today, and you may have a lot of questions, uh, particularly about supernatural. Chris, who are the immortals? Well, the, the term immortal, I mean, technically it means imperishable, or one who does not die. Um, in the book of Genesis chapter 3, we learned that death was a curse that man brought on himself through disobedience, through, through, through sin. And this is something that didn't happen to these other beings that God has created that we call technically usually angels. Mm -hmm. uh, the Bible uses the term angels. Sometimes it says hosts. In the Psalms, it says they were created forever and ever, um, which tells me that they had a beginning, mm -hmm. but they weren't, uh, they don't, they're not under the curse of death. Therefore, they are the immortals. Now, the term angel technically means messenger. It's a Greek word, angelos, uh -huh. messenger. In the Hebrew, it would be malak. So it's more of a role it's more than of a job it is a, yeah, a description of what they are. Mm -hmm. it's, it's what they do what they more do. than what they are. So I didn't yeah. like, I don't like using the term angel because some of the, the beings that we see discussed in Scripture, the seraphim, uh, the cherubim, these are don't look like humans at all. They, right. They're not the messengers that we see in the Gospels. For instance, you know, when Jesus, when the stone was rolled away and there was a shining man standing there, that, you know, that looked like a human. But you read the description of a seraphim, and we have a serpentine, reptilian, six-winged type being. Yes. Completely different. Uh, something that would be quite fearsome, I think, if you encountered it. Absolutely. Now, let's talk about uh, aliens for a minute, because... I think every school child the world over, if you say the word alien in his or her respective language, they're going to have a, an instant uh, image pop up into their mind. An alien would be somebody who drives a flying saucer uh, and gets out and, and says, take me to your leader <laughs> and all this and that. You know, space aliens are in the vernacular. Uh, but you're using the term immortal. Uh, the Vatican, Tom, is, has talked about aliens. Mm -hmm. would, would you baptize an alien? Is, is that the, an actual uh, book title, I believe? Uh, so let's talk about the relationship between the common conception of an alien and what are called in your book the immortals. Hmm. I think a, in a, an interesting point to make in, in that regard would be um, that instead of the term alien, perhaps extraterrestrial would be more... Uh, okay. precise because that means not of this earth okay sure so these beings that we're talking about these immortals they're not of this earth right so in a technical sense they are extraterrestrials yet in the classic sense most people are thinking of you know the little gray aliens that perhaps live on another planet somewhere and that naturally evolved by some naturalistic process and that's not what we're talking about at all we're talking about the beings that we see in the in the scripture in the sacred scripture that we believe to be the truth and you know we're we're trying to find the underlying reality behind the words in the scriptures okay back to Tom yeah. now we've laid this out we, we're, we're talking about immortals we're talking about aliens we're talking about the Bible living in the time that we do uh, 
there, there's kind of a raging battle going on. I know you're familiar with it. I, I'm involved uh, with it as, as someone who teaches Bible prophecy, and that is uh, the supernatural seems to be coming more and more and more into the forefront of our daily lives, and there are a lot of people resisting this. Uh, your book, I think, is aimed directly at uh, breaking the ice there, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, we, we do see that. You're on the forefront of it, and you and I both are keenly aware. But isn't it interesting how that most of the resistance is coming from inside old denominationalism? Uh, many, many people are leaving the church. They tell us that Islam's growing three times faster than Christianity now. Why are so many people losing interest in the church while at the same time the world has never been more fascinated in, in the supernatural? Uh -huh. And not just the supernatural. They also have questions about things like aliens. You know, this mo new movie that just came out, Interstellar, is dealing with the ideal of traversable wormholes. And the internet has opened up kind of a, a data system for the world to be able to fascinate with every kind of possible, you know, particle physics that are going on over at CERN. And, and even at CERN, you know, some of the projects are doing is because they want to find is there evidence of parallel universes, of parallel realities. And what we're saying as Christians who are fundamentalists but who are also prophecy believers, we're saying that there is indeed a parallel reality. The Bible has talked about it. There are good beings there that are there. There are evil beings that are there. But the most overlooked aspect of end times Bible prophecy has to do with the gates. That's why we call this on the path of the immortals and start out by talking about doorways of the earth. That was the light that went on. When we no. came down off of Mount Graham, that was the light that went on. You missed a big part, the Apache said. This is a stargate. This is a doorway. And that's why they are there, which kind of went back to what Malachi Martin said. They are there <laughs> watching something yeah, you indeed. can't see from somewhere else. And, and so what we wanted to know, is that, a, is that a biblical idea? Can that be supported in the Scripture that there are locations on the earth that are strategic, that are areas where, what, the, the veil is thinner? or Because we use these terms like stargate, portal, doorway, because we don't know what other word to use. Well, you know, the idea of such a gate is uh, becoming more and more uh, in the vernacular of, of people who study the Bible. Enoch spoke of Mount Hermon as a place where the, the fallen angels came down to earth. You might call it a kind of a gate. Uh, the Tower of Babel maybe was a gate of some kind that enabled uh, some kind of traffic between heaven and earth. And then, of course, in Revelation 9, you have uh, a, a something called the bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. And a, an angel comes down with a key and opens some kind of a door and releases alien, uh, if you will, uh, spirits out onto the surface of the earth. So it really is a biblical concept. Well, and it's one that a lot of people have not thought about. That's what I'm saying is that what, what this does, it kind of opens your eyes and says, look, stop for a moment and think about how the Bible describes the world itself. The world is described as, in very dynamic terms as if it's a holding tank, as if it's a prison. And it describes things that are down beneath the surface of the earth. And you're right, the book of Revelation, a star falls from heaven with a key to the bottomless pit. And he opens it up, and what happens? This terrible freak show locust horde comes up out of the yeah. earth. These things are in the earth, right? It, would these be the immortals that we're talking about? It, it would seem to be. that They, they definitely are uh, uh, fearsome creatures that come up from the earth, and they don't appear to be human. <laughs> They are scorpion creatures with lion-like hair. And, and, and they have a king over them who is called Abaddon, right. who is also called Apollyon, Apollo. You and I have talked a lot about him before, uh, that, that six-pack version of whatever that special is you guys are talking about <laughs> has a whole book in there Yes, They're talking about Apollyon. Oh, and by the way, in, in a few moments we're going to tell you about uh, how you can obtain the book that Tom just mentioned. But right now, what I want to do and what I'm, I'm, I'm aiming at is, is bringing out a truth that, that is hitting us all in the face these days and we're looking the other way. Because everything that Tom and Chris uh, have just been talking about is kind of a preface to what they then did. You guys actually... Uh, went to the people who live in the uh, arena, if you will, the area of Mount Graham, and then uh, 
I guess, I, I don't know how many thousand acres we're talking about, but a lot of territory there occupied by uh, Navajo, Hopi Indians, who have a, who knows how old a teaching it is, a, a traditional teaching about these immortals. And they, they, these stories actually jibe with what's in the Bible. Now this is very intriguing to me. Tell us about your trip to that area. Yeah, I'll tell you uh, about the trip to the Anasazi, and then he went to the southern side of the ancient Anasazi ruins into Sedona, where down there he actually captured on film what may have been a light being or one of the immortals or who knows what it was, but and then got buzzed by a big craft. Well, he can tell you about that. Wow. But, but yeah, so while he's in Sedona, uh, we had to pick and choose. There are so many locations, even in the United States of America, that are connected to this idea of a doorway where anomalous activity has been filmed for a long period of time, but right now where it seems like it's accelerating, it's happening more often, as if we're moving towards an omega point, as we're moving towards something that we're not quite sure about, right? So we wanted to keep this in biblical context, and we also, here's one thing you learn real fast. Even though we were connect, uh, contacted by a member of the Apache tribe, most of these nations will not talk to non-tribal members. They've been burned too many times by New Agers that get their stories and then take them out of context. Uh, the Hopi won't talk to you at all. You can't, they won't even allow you to record a conversation or even keep notes if they do talk to you. Hmm. Well, anyway, long story short, it was a miracle. We wound up getting to go to the Navajo Nation in the Four Corners area of the United States, sit down with the Navajo Nation's third generation medicine man who's also an academic. He's an author. They use his books uh, inside of their schools, and he let us sit in a traditional hogan and film him for three hours. Now here's one of the one of the highlights of that conversation. That he's telling us, we're asking him, what happened to the Anasaze, right? The, the old ones. Yeah. The, the ancient Indian tribes that just mis mysteriously disappeared. They mysteriously disappeared and overnight. And so they try to have theories. Where did they go? Well, you know, what happened to them? And there's a traditional story that says that a drought came. It lasted six, seven years, something like that. So they migrated slowly out of the Four Corners area to some other place so that they could survive, right? Yeah. The problem is when archaeology started looking into those cliff dwellings, they found that they had left everything behind. Bags of salt that would have been as valuable as gold. They traded it like money, and they used it for preserving food. They left the salt. They left their weapons. They left tools. They were gone like that. So what happened to the Anasaze? Well, one way that you pronounce their name means the ancient ones, but another way you pronounce the title given to them means an ancient alien enemy. Hmm. And there are stories preserved of those who fought against giants and whatever. So Dr. Don Mose, the academic, he's sitting there, he's telling us the traditional story. They migrated. When I challenged that story, it's great because we captured all this on film, right? He looks up into the camera and he says, well, I shouldn't tell you this, but he said, if you would have asked my great-great-grandfather, who was also a medicine man, he said, here's the story that he told. And then he begins describing a portal that opened in the Four Corners area of the United States, real early American history. And he describes a reptilian that comes down through this, like the fiery flying seraphim. And they even put a halo around his head to represent that he was something that had come down from heaven. They draw a spiral vortex next to it to uh, emulate some kind of a portal that he came through. Mm -hmm. And guess what? Not only did he come through, we filmed giant uh, six-toed footprints that are painted right next to the reptilian and the portal in pursuit of much smaller <laughs> five-toed uh, footprints that are trying to get away from whatever this is. And he tells us a story. Well, then the Apache, they say, yeah, a disc came down at the same time over Mount Graham. It had the, the creator inside of it. He begins creating all this good stuff, but then a dragon. Pardon me, pardon me, a disc? <clears throat> yeah. And maybe a silvery disc? That's what they say. A silvery disc? A silvery disc. And, hey, come on. Now, yeah. Suddenly the, the, we have the intersection of flying saucers with ancient Indian mythology. Uh, can we deal with that? Well, the Bible talks about God moving about in a chariot. Uh, it's described in Scripture. 
you know, we, we don't know what, when we, like UFOs and all that kind of thing, we don't know what that is, but that could be good and evil. It could be de angelic type devices. I mean, do you know what it is? I don't know what it is. But the point is, as soon as he left, something else came through the portal at Mount Graham. Well, guess what? Once again, fiery flying seraphim uh, come through, and then the giants follow through, and they start devouring everybody. The Indians run into the mountains and start crying to God, who sends, they say, a flood that covers the face of the earth and wipes out the giants. And, and the dates that they place behind the petroglyphs and the storyline on this side of the world match exactly the same date in history when Moses on the other side of the world is writing, and there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that. Wow. Same timing, yeah. same time frame, same, picture, same uh, picture graphs, uh, just an amazing story. On the path of the immortals. Now, we haven't touched three pages in, the, <laughs> in this book. This, this thing is packed with this kind of information. And, and Tom, the way I see it, we have an intersection of the old mythology and the new mythology. The 21st century mythology of UFO aliens coming down from outer space and the ancient mythology of aliens coming down from some kind of a portal intersecting with mankind, terrible spiritual warfare going on, uh, human beings being killed, having to flee for their lives from non-human creatures. All of this has been relegated to the dustbin of history, to mythology. Nobody believes mythology after all. It's just a bunch of made up stories. But let's go now to Sedona, Arizona. You mentioned Chris went over to Sedona, Arizona. Now when I think of Sedona, I think of uh, the harmonic convergence. I think of New Agers flocking there to have some kind of a spiritual experience. Uh, tell us about uh, your, your trip to Sedona. And it was a research trip, right? Absolutely. And, and the reasons that you cited, that you think of, the New Age movement, the harmonic convergence, right. which was, what, 1987? Uh-huh. Uh, That's right. And really what that was was a worldwide exercise in uh, transcendental meditation where they were actually trying to, to contact aliens, to many of them. bring these people down. They absolutely did. They, wow. Um, they held hands around a place called Bell Rock in Sedona, which is one of the vortex areas in Sedona. And you got a picture of Bell Rock, by and the I way. Do. And it, they it, actually it, believed a mothership was going to appear out of that rock in, in 87. And that, of course, didn't happen. <laughs> but um, well, I don't think so. Sedona yeah. is really the capital of the New Age movement. And around 1981, there was a psychic medium, uh, Paige Bryant, who channeled an entity named Albion. Now, Albion named some certain areas as vortex areas, okay? Now, vortex is kind of a spiral energy, yeah. like a tornado right. or yeah. something like that, but they're talking about some sort of spiritual energy, some sort of something that you feel, you get the Sedona feeling when you're there. So there's just all these famous vortex areas. Uh, New Agers often speak of them in terms of portals to these other realms. Um, one of the famous areas, there's also an area called the Bradshaw Ranch. Uh, this is famous in, in UFO literature as the site of many UFO sightings, and also in paranormal literature as where people see a lot of orbs, these light orbs. Now, I had always been very skeptical of the orb phenomenon, thinking that and most of it was camera anomalies, dust, sure. and things like that, and, and those do cause things that look like that. Now, we set up two cameras. That way, if it was a camera anomaly, it would only show on one. Okay. Uh -huh. And we did catch some of these orbs on two cameras at the same time, uh, even on film moving about. We even have a clip of that available uh, for, the, for the audience. So you can actually see one of these move, and it moves apparently in an evasive manner. And so I went from complete orb skeptic to uh, orb believer. Um, we Actually, my photographer even saw one with the naked eye. He, he saw it without even a camera flying around out there near the Bradshaw Ranch. Now, now this is the kind of thing that the Christians would be specifically warned against. In other words, don't have anything to do with the, the, the dark spiritual world, don't have anything to do with anything that smacks of demonology or the supernatural. Stay strictly away from that. Uh, pray uh, for protection from it, if anything. That would be the closest a Christian would get to such a thing. You're on a research trip. What did you come away with? 
Well, we came away with that footage, which I think does show that there's something interesting going on that isn't easily explained away. Another thing that happened is that we actually caught a huge V-shaped UFO. And I say UFO, meaning unidentified flying object, sure. because yeah. we don't know what it is. I'm not claiming it's any kind of extraterrestrial craft. In fact, my best guess would be maybe it's a top secret government project or something like that, but it's very odd looking. And we didn't even hear it. We didn't even know we had it on film until we got home and we're going through our photographs and we said, what is that V thing up in the air? And so we'll make that a photo available as well uh, to your audience. But You know, I can't tell you, I'm looking at the clock and, and we are practically out of time and we haven't even begun. I mean, this is so exciting, folks. And it, it is biblical in scope because the Bible predicts that phenomena uh, the, of the sort that we're talking about would, would become more and more pronounced as we approach the last of the last days. And Tom, I think that's really what you're uh, trying to, to pursue here. Yeah, in fact we go, we go beyond saying it's pronounced. We say that the Bible predicts that these gateways of the earth are going to open. Those things that came out of them once before that led to havoc are predicted to come back again. Maybe we'll talk about that in a different show. Right now, I just want to talk to talk about the, the book itself, On the Path of the Immortals, uh, yours for 1995, from the Prophecy Watchers online bookstore. That's prophecywatchers.com. And I was totally intrigued. I, I, I got a chance to read the manuscript of this before it was even printed, and I, I was just pulled along by the intersection between the old mythology and the new mythology. And we are living in this time. It's extremely exciting to me. It's called On the Path of the uh, Immortals, Tom Horn, Chris Putnam, 1995. Now, we do have something called the Immortals Package, which you'll also find on the prophecywatchers.com uh, bookstore page. And that is six books that have been written by uh, Tom and or Chris. Uh, Exo Vaticana, Petrus Romanus, Zenith 2016, Forbidden Gates, Nephilim Stargates, the Ariman Gate, six books. And we're offering those for $99.95. If you take advantage of the Immortals package, you'll get On the Path of the Immortals absolutely free. It's right there, prophecywatchers.com. Gentlemen, we are down to our last few seconds. I am breathless. Uh, I can't wait for the next program. And I, I hope you'll join us because we're really going to get into some deep and interesting stuff, all backed by Scripture. Let's, uh, in about 30 seconds, Tom, let's talk about the fact that we're not running wild here. We are keeping the Bible squarely in the forefront of our thinking. Right? Absolutely. There's multiple examples that are in the book that talk about these gateways of the earth, that talk about the entities that await behind them. But there's also scientific evidence that's come up of late. We can talk about that too. Scientific evidence uh, in of a number. subsurface reality. And, and by the way, there's something in Switzerland that we'll talk about, a huge scientific project called CERN. Tom and Chris, next time, this is going to be interesting. I'm Gary Stearman. Keep watching, everybody. We are. Thanks for joining us on Prophecy Watchers. Follow us at facebook.com slash prophecy watchers. In the meantime, keep watching everybody and we'll see you soon.